So this video is all about different file formats for design, which might not seem like the most exciting subject, but when you're exporting files for either print or the web, it's important to know the different options out there and what they mean, and also how to figure out which one is best for the particular project that you're working on. So I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different things to consider when picking a file format. And the first one of those things is vector versus raster. So vector file formats include PDF, EPS, SVG, and AI. And raster formats include JPEG, GIF, PNG, TIFF, RAW, and .psd. And I'll be talking about all those in more depth as we continue on here. But just to break down some of the differences really quick between what is a vector file versus what is a raster file, a vector file is a file that works on a mathematical point system. So instead of something like a raster file, which uses pixels, vectors can be scaled indefinitely because it's just considering different points and the actions between those points as opposed to a specific pixel. So because of that, vector files are super useful when you're trying to create work that can be scaled indefinitely and work that typically falls under these considerations are stuff like logos or icons or type work. That's all really good to do in vectors so that if you have to scale it up really big to like, let's say be on a billboard, you can do that with a vector format and you won't lose any quality. If you've ever tried to take, let's say a JPEG, which is a raster format and make that really big when when it wasn't meant to be, it becomes heavily pixelated and distorted, which is a big problem if you're trying to do something professional with that. So Vector solves that problem because it works in a different way. It doesn't use pixels, it uses a point-based system. And Adobe Illustrator is the industry standard program for Vector, although there are a lot of different Vector programs out there. For example, Inkscape is a free Vector one that's roughly equivalent to Illustrator. But once again, just a quick breakdown to keep in mind for Vector. The important thing with this is it's infinitely scalable, which is a big deal if you're trying to make big things. So next up here, we have Raster, which Adobe Photoshop is usually considered the industry standard program for raster images, and it works on a pixel grid. So basically when I'm saying pixel grid, you're working on a fixed size. So let's say you're designing something for a 1080p screen. So the pixel grid would be 1080 pixels high by 1920 pixels wide. And it's gonna be that fixed size. And within that fixed size will be pixels for each one of those different points. And each pixel for all those different points on that grid are assigned a color. And that's what ends up making an image. So if you were to zoom in super far into a photo of a tree, you would eventually get in close enough Enough that you see all the little individual colors that make up that tree and as you zoom out it starts to make the actual image that you're looking at and raster images by default are meant to be presented at a set size so if you want to make a raster image really large you want to start at the desired size you don't want to make it larger after you've completed it because when you try to make a raster image much larger than its initial size that's when you get really bad pixelation or blur issues. Usually you can make raster images smaller and they'll look okay, although that can sometimes have some kind of weird issues as well. But typically with any raster based format, it's better to work too big than to work too small and then try to make it larger in the end. And raster images are ideal for things like photos, web graphics, and illustrations that have very complex coloring and shadows. But there are, of course, a ton of different file formats out there that are raster, some of which are more suited to something like web graphics and some of which are more suited to photos. So we'll keep on going into that here. And before we go into the individual file formats and breaking those down, there's two main considerations, much like vector and raster when it comes to file formats. And there's also another consideration known as lossy versus lossless. And lossy means basically when you save a file to that format that you're losing data. So think of that as something like a JPEG, where if you've ever seen a really pixelated, rough, grainy looking JPEG, it's because that's a lossy file format. And over time, the compression of trying to shrink that file size down has taken away so much data that it makes the end image look poor. 
And also has some other examples that might not be pure design files are MPEG for video or H.264 for video. So if you ever watched a video online that looks really pixelated or compressed, that's because it's done on a lossy format. And in order to make the file size a lot smaller, they had to lose data. You have to give up something to make that file size smaller. And that's where the pixelation occurs. MP3s are also a lossy format where if you ever heard way back when really old MP3s that were encoded at a very low bit rate, they sounded terrible because of how much data they were giving up to get to that file size. So typically, like it says below here, it removes unnecessary data to reduce the file size, and that results in smaller images. And of course, if you're really smart with how you compress a JPEG, for example, the difference in quality, at least visually, shouldn't be very noticeable. Oftentimes it's very hard to tell at all, but there is some data loss occurring whenever you save to that file format. And there's also lossless file formats which maintain all the data from the original file. So GIF, and that's kind of a tricky one because usually GIFs look pretty rough because it has a maximum color amount of 256, but you could save a GIF over and over and over again, and it would never lose any more quality, where if you continually compress something like a JPEG, over time it will look more and more rough as it continues to lose more and more data. TIFF is a lossless file size, very often used for very, very high quality photos. And then PNG, which is sort of like the replacement of GIF, which is extremely popular for web-based formats. So continuing on here, we have some source file formats, and these are basically all of the Adobe source file formats. So if you ever hear these extensions, you can know what they mean. .ai is for Adobe Illustrator. .psd is for Adobe Photoshop. .indd is for InDesign. AEP is for After Effects. PRProj is for Adobe Premiere Pro and .sesx is for Adobe Audition. So that's the main brunt of the Adobe suite, and those file extensions are what you'll see if you ever save out files into those programs. And as far as like how to mentally think about source files, any source file is basically a lossless file format. So like let's say you bring in a photo to Photoshop that's a lossy format like JPEG. Even though the JPEG is lossy, when you save it inside Photoshop, Photoshop won't cause that photo to lose any more data than it already has by being compressed because Photoshop isn't gonna recompress that photo over and over again. So you can make changes and resave it as many times as you want and the source file will always maintain its full quality level, which is why source files are an ideal format to do all of your editing work in before you export it to whatever the final version is going to be which are typically the other formats I described earlier and that I'm now going to cover in more depth. So first up here is JPEG, which stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group, which is kind of a weird name for the extension, but I'm assuming a group of very smart people came together who were photographers and then they designed this as the standard for photography. I could be wrong there, but it just makes sense based on the name. So JPEG is a lossy format, as I explained earlier, and it's also a raster format, which means it works on that pixel grid. It's taken at a set size. It's currently the most common online image format, although PNG is kind of getting up closer to that. And it allows the ability to selectively compress or to select a compression level. So typically when you go to Photoshop and save as on a JPEG, you can use a sliding scale from zero to 12, with 12 being maximum quality and zero being the lowest quality, as you can kind of decide how you want this photo to look. So if you take a photo and save it down at zero, typically you'll start to see a lot of pixelation, a lot of weird artifacts that happen from high compression, but you'll get the smallest file size, whereas 12, Typically you won't see as much compression, if any compression at all, but the file size will also be larger because of that. So it's kind of up to you to, at your discretion to decide what's the right compression level for the way that your photo is going to be viewed. Especially with something like online photos where you don't expect someone to pull the photo and zoom in really far, you can usually get away with quite a bit of compression and it won't be all that visible because programs have become really good at compressing JPEGs in particular. So like I said before, this is great for online photos, very complex illustrations where there's lots of color blending or shadowing, that kind of stuff. Really complex things that use lots and lots of different colors and especially lots of different colors that very closely interact with each other. 
Next up, we have GIF, which stands for Graphics Interchange Format. This is a lossless format, and it is also raster, but it is limited to 256 colors. So even though it's lossless and it won't lose more data as you save it over and over again, it'll really take a lot out of a photo because of that 256 color color limit, at least if the photo is something like an actual photo from a camera. As you save that to a GIF, it might look a lot worse, which might make you think it's a lossy format, but that doesn't make it a lossy format. It's just a limitation of the format itself. And it's probably best known for allowing animations. When you think GIF, you probably think animated GIF, although that's kind of becoming replaced now with various video formats as the internet has become much quicker and the need for super small animations has kind of gone away as people can kind of just watch videos as they please now. But I have a feeling the term animated GIF will stick along a lot longer than this actual format will. And it's best used when there's large areas of solid or limited colors. And that's because of that 256 color limit. So if you're dealing with something with like 16 or 32 colors, a GIF will often look great because it doesn't have to worry about limiting the amount of colors that you're using. So you won't really notice the weird changes or differences in a photo that you would if you used a really complex photo with thousands or millions of colors, for example. GIF also allows transparency, which is something that JPEG does not, which is a huge bonus if you're trying to perhaps overlay an image over something else and you need that transparency to be there. But also, like I said before in the video, this is becoming an outdated format. It was originally one of the most popular formats on the web, but as the PNG has come in, and quite frankly, the PNG often does a much better job, that's rapidly replacing the GIF in real world use. So this is the PNG or portable network graphic. This is also a lossless file and also a raster file. This is basically a web standard for images. And when I say images, it tends to be stuff like large areas of solid or limited colors, much like the GIF. If you're dealing with something like an actual camera taken photo, JPEG is still the go-to format to use because Typically, at least typically, PNGs will become much larger in file size than a well-compressed JPEG when you're dealing with a very complex image. But when you're dealing with an image that only uses a small subset of colors, PNGs are super efficient at that. And because of that, they can offer very, very small file sizes when used correctly. So when you're trying to think of images or a design style that works best for PNGs, think of flat design. When talking flat design, an illustration might have 8, 10, 16 colors, something like that. That's where the PNG really shines and is an ideal file format to use when saving out, especially when you're doing it for something on the web. And it also allows for transparency, which is super useful and helpful if you're trying to overlay it on other objects, just like the GIF. Although unlike with the GIF, this does not allow animation, so that's perhaps a shortcoming in comparison. Next up, we have the TIFF file format, and it stands for Tagged Image Format. It's a lossless raster image file. It's extremely high quality, and it's most commonly used in print. So this is not something you're going to want to use on the web pretty much ever because it has a typically extremely high file size. An interesting thing about TIFF is it allows for lossless, either LZW or ZIP, or lossy JPEG compression. So there are formats like TIFF that are considered lossless, but that you can then apply a lossy compression to if that's something you wanna to do to help knock down that size a bit. But the use of TIFFs pretty much resides in print work where you wanna maintain that super high quality image or when dealing in photography a lot of cameras will allow you to export directly to a TIFF as opposed to instantly compressing it in a format like a JPEG where you lose quality as soon as the photo is taken which isn't really ideal. Next up we have RAW which is also a camera format and it is format that is basically the raw data captured by a digital camera. I believe some scanners can also export as a raw file. And typically a raw file contains two separate files and the extensions of those files will depend on the camera type you're using. So a Canon camera versus let's say a Sony camera may have different extensions for the secondary files on their raw extension. But the cool thing about raw is it allows for non-destructive editing. So when you bring a raw file format into something like Lightroom or Photoshop, you can go ahead and then make adjustments to things like exposure, the overall color balance, 
all of that stuff, which will be saved in the secondary file as the modifications you've made, but the original file, the original photo will remain exactly unchanged. So you can go ahead and make as many changes as you want to it and then revert back to the original should you ever need to do that. And working in a non-destructive manner like that is super awesome and is almost always considered best practice. And that's where raw really shines as a format. But raw as a format isn't intended to be the end use format. It's sort of an in-between. So once you've brought your photo into Lightroom or Photoshop and you have it ready to go, that's when you typically export it to another format like JPEG or TIFF when everything is good to go. Next up here we have EPS, which stands for Encapsulated Postscript. It's a vector format, although it can also contain raster images. And I put a little asterisk there because if you've ever worked as a designer and you've requested a vector file, you very well may have at some point gotten either an EPS or a .ai Illustrator file that then had a JPEG saved into it, which saving a JPEG or a raster image into a vector format does not magically make that particular file into a vector format. So never be one of those people if that's something you're ever asked to do or are considering doing. Don't ever pull in a JPEG into like let's say an EPS and then assume that it's suddenly magically made vector. It'll just be a JPEG raster image saved inside an EPS or typically vector format. And EPS files are very often used to contain things like a single design element. So let's say logos or a t-shirt design, something like that, where the end use is intended to be printed at whatever scale is deemed necessary. Because it is vector, they can scale them up to be whatever size they need to be, which makes it an ideal format for that. So you can print stuff as small as a little business card logo to something on the side of a building if you had to, without any worries about losing quality. SVG or scalable vector graphics is also a vector file format, but this one's kind of a special case because it's defined by XML files. And I'm not going to go too far into the nitty gritty here, but because this is more of a web standard when it comes to working with vector graphics, it has some unique capabilities. And one of those is that you can use CSS styling on it to produce certain looks with those SVGs when you bring them in. And it's very popular with elements like icons because you can kind of program in SVG positioning for those icons. I'm not really an expert when it comes to that stuff, but for example, I used to make interactive maps in Illustrator. And when we exported those out, we would export them in SVG file format, which could then be brought into the web where we could add stuff like coloring for the different map shapes all that stuff. It was a very flexible format because you could basically program different things into it by properly naming out your layers and then telling those layers to be colored a certain color, for example. So a pretty cool format for that reason, but also tends to have very specialized uses. And the last one here we have is PDF or portable document format. And PDF is a vector format, although it can also contain raster images. PDF is basically a big container for multiple different file formats. And it's very, very popular for sending stuff to print because it's a near universal standard, meaning almost everyone anywhere can open up and use a PDF. And PDFs can also be used online for displaying complex documents. So if you ever opened up a multi-page document like a contract online, odds are it was served to you as a PDF. And PDFs also have some pretty cool capabilities like the ability to add signatures or add forms to so people can then modify and resave them. So most legal documents, for example, tend to be PDFs for that reason. They offer a lot of flexibility. They offer a certain amount of interactivity. And quite frankly, you can put pretty much anything into a PDF, save it, and nearly anyone should be able to open that, whether it's on a computer, on a phone, operating systems don't matter. It's cool for that reason. But that's really it for this video. I've covered pretty much all the major different file formats to consider when exporting or saving for design. So hopefully when you think about how you're gonna save your file formats or what's gonna work the best, this will help give you a little bit of context. But of course, if you have additional questions or wanna know more about a certain thing, feel free to leave comments in the comments section. And if you did find this video helpful, feel free to hit the thumbs up button to let me know. And also, if you wanna see more videos like this, please subscribe. I do my best to keep creating new content just like this for designers. Thank you so much for watching.